Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making my start on my review of The Binding by Bridget Collins. Uh, so this book was actually given to me by Susie, my uh, girlfriend. She gave this to me because she enjoyed it herself. So I thought, I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, I want to read the uh, author bio first, then I'm going to read you the blurb, and then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs and share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. Bridget Collins trained as an actor at the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art after reading English at King's College, Cambridge. She is the author of seven acclaimed books for young adults and has had two plays produced, one at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. The Binding is her first adult novel. Now, I will say straight away, one thing that I got from this, it made me think of how like books kind of have a mouth feel. Um, I don't know how else to explain it. You know, you'd get that with food, like the way that something feels in your mouth, it kind of adds a certain amount to your enjoyment of it and certain books have like a mouthfeel or the, the literary equivalent of a mouthfeel and this does have a very pleasant mouthfeel, it's just enjoyable to read, you know? So the blurb, imagine you could erase your grief, imagine you could forget your pain, imagine you could hide a secret, forever. Emmett Farmer is working in the fields when a letter arrives summoning him to begin an apprenticeship. He will work for a bookbinder, a vocation that arouses fear, superstition and prejudice, but one neither he nor his parents can afford to refuse. He will learn to handcraft beautiful volumes, and within each and within each, he will capture something unique and extraordinary, a memory. If there's, nothing, if there's something you want to forget, he can help. If there's something you need to erase, he can assist. Your past will be stored safely in a book and you will never remember your secret, however terrible. In a vault under his mentor's workshop, row upon row of books and memories are meticulously stored and recorded. Then one day Emmett makes an astonishing discovery. One of them has his name on it. The Binding is an unforgettable magical novel, a boundary-defying love story, and a unique literary event. So, uh, as you can kind of tell, books are frowned upon in this society, so um, his father catches him with a book and hits him and then says, Don't ever let me see you with a book again. And then we get, But now they were sending me to the binder, as though whatever danger Pa had warned me against had been replaced by something worse. As though now I was the danger. So, uh, and then he meets the binder and she says, It's alright, think, I've got this... It's all right, think I've got this old without knowing what people say about me, about us. I looked away, but she went on as if she hadn't noticed. Your parents kept books away from you, didn't they? And now you don't know what you're doing here. You, as you asked for me, didn't you? She seemed not to hear. Don't worry, lad. It's a craft like any other, and a good one. Binding's as old as the alphabet. Older. People don't understand it, but why should they? She grimaced. At least the crusade's over. You're too young to remember that. Your good fortune. There was a silence. I didn't understand how binding could be older than books, but she was staring into the middle distance as if I wasn't there. A breeze set the wire swinging and the coloured papers flapped. She blinked and scratched her chin and her eyes came back to mine. Tomorrow I'll start you on some chores, tidying, cleaning the brushes, that sort of thing. Maybe get you pairing leather. And then um, the postman is basically shows up, delivers some mail and he says, see you in spring, because it's winter and whatnot. And, um, and so, uh, a sharp blue eye glinted at me from the space between his hat and scarf. Your first time out here, isn't it? Don't worry, she always makes it through. With that, he clicked to the shivering horse and jolted off down our path towards the road. I stood there watching until he was out of sight, in spite of the cold. If I'd known, I racked my brain to remember what I'd said in my letter to my family, the last one this year. But what would I have added? Wish them a happy turning, that was all. In a way, I was glad that home felt so far away, that I could stand there and feel nothing, as if the freezing air had numbed my mind as well as my fingers. So here we find out a little bit more about what's happening. Sarah just turned away and dropped the knife into the open drawer by my side. Memories, she said at last. Not people, Emmett. We take memories and bind them. Whatever people can't bear to remember. Whatever they can't live with. We take those memories and put them where they can't do any more harm. That's all books are. Finally, I met her eyes. Her expression was open, candid, a little weary, like her voice. She made it sound so right, so necessary, like a doctor describing an amputation. There's a, a quote here that I quite liked. Uh, someone, was it Alter, had once told me that your left hand showed the fate you were born with, and your right showed the fate you made for yourself. I mean, obviously, palmistry is a load of bollocks, but if it wasn't, that would be really cool. And in this world, it's fictional, so I'll allow that. So, um... Susie, uh, so as I say, uh, this book, I think I said this, thank you Susie for giving me this book anyway, or lending me this book, I'll give it back to you when I'm done. You, by the time she's watching this, Big E, she's probably already got the book back. Um, but we were having a conversation about eating pickles straight from the jar, and I can't remember why we were talking about it, but I'm sure, have I got something in my hair? What is this in my hair? 
Yeah, we were having this conversation, and I don't think it had anything to do with this book, um, but we were talking about eating pickles directly from the jar. And we get this right at the beginning, which I'm sure would be before, like way before, she would have read this bit way before we had that conversation. So maybe it was like stuck in her head subconsciously, but um, I was ravenous. I found myself in the pantry gorging on pickles out of a jar and then sated. I was so exhausted I couldn't see straight. I'd meant to take a bowl of soup up to Serideth, but I fell asleep at the kitchen table with my head on my arms. Biggie, are you being a needy boy? So the rules of binding, which is this magic of, it's basically like like mind bleach. Um, so they can, a, a binder essentially can sort of almost like draw out the painful memories out of somebody. The cat's going for the, what are you doing? Why are you climbing up there? Why, what are you doing? What are you doing? Sorry, this is a very distracted review, as you can tell. Um, but yeah, so the binders can like draw out these like negative memories basically and, and put them into books. Um, and so the golden rules are, uh, you merely have to lay hands on the subject and listen. As long as you take paper and a pen and ink and make sure you're both sitting down and that she's consented, you can hardly go wrong. And uh, I just like the fact that consent is included in the, <laughs> in the list of golden rules, you know? And it's important too, because Otherwise, you know, we'll, we'll see as we get later into it because I have more tabs to talk about, but Biggie, Biggie. So I thought this was an interesting little line here. It says, uh, through the archway at the end of the passage was the hall, tiled with black and white, with a bank of ferns at one side and a figure behind them who stopped, appalled at the sight of me. I realized it was a mirror. I don't like mirrors, they freak me out. I thought this, this was quite a cool little uh, soliloquy here, I suppose. Uh, I don't actually see who the character is here, but uh, he says, He finished his brandy and stood watching me, idly stroking the neck of the decanter. You binders, he said in a new, almost friendly voice, as if he were a host and I were his guest. You give me the chills. What's it like when you're inside someone's mind? When they're naked and helpless and you're so close you can taste them? It must be rather like fucking to order, is it? But he didn't expect me to answer. And then you come groveling to men like my father for more. Silence. The fire scratched and muttered in the hearth. There's a growing trade in fates, you know. Does that concern you? He paused, but he didn't seem surprised not to get an answer. I've never seen one, well, as far as I know, but I'm curious. Could one really tell the difference? Novels, they call them. They must be much cheaper to produce. You can copy them, you see. Use the same story over and over, and as long as you're careful how you sell them, you can get away with it. It makes one wonder who would write them. People who enjoy imagining misery, I suppose. People who have no scruples about dishonesty. People who can spend days writing a long, sad lie without getting insane. People who can spend days writing a long, sad lie without going insane. He flicked one fingernail against the decanter, punctuating what he said with a tiny clink. My father, of course, is a connoisseur. He claims that he would know instantly if he saw a novel. He says that a real, authentic book breathes an unmistakable scent of, well, he calls it truth or life. I think maybe he means despair. One of the characters thinks she's fallen in love at first sight, which is one of my least favourite tropes. <laughs> There's also hate to love going on here, which I'm also not a fan of. And then we get this quite disturbing scene, because, um, I mean, trigger warnings for, like, sexual abuse, basically. And uh, this scene is sort of one of those scenes, but I'm going to read it out. I mean, I thought it was well handled. I saw you, Lord Archimbolt said. You've got a big, plump, juicy pheasant in your bag. For Annan, shoot a pheasant. I slid a sideways look at Darnay, but he was frowning at the floor. Oh, sir, she said again. Her accent was broader than it should have been. She sounded like her grandmother. You caught me. You're too clever for me. That's right, you've been a very naughty girl. I'm very sorry, sir. There was a little quaver in her voice. Say it. Oh, sir, I've been a very naughty girl. And you know what happens to naughty little girls like you, don't you? Oh, she breathed out with a hiccup. Oh, please don't, Lord Archimbolt. I'm only a naughty little poacher. I promise I won't. Bend over and take up your skirts. Embarrassment flooded through me like boiling water, and then, an instant later, the insane desire to laugh. I screwed up my face, trying to repress it. Beside me, Darnay put both hands over his mouth and took a long, shuddering breath. If he caught my eye, I curled my toes into the floor and clenched my fists. If he made a sound, thwack, a belt on bare skin. Then Peranan said, without emphasis, Ooh. I nearly burst out laughing then. Who would have guessed that Peranan was such a bad actress? I willed myself not to look at Darnay. That was the most important thing. But I could feel him shaking with the effort to stay silent. One shared glance and we'd both be on the floor. 
Six of the best, young lady. Thwack, ooh, thwack, ooh, thwack. An infinitesimal pause, as if she wasn't concentrating. Ooh, please, sir. Now, have you learnt your lesson? A pause and the rustle of fabric. Then he gave a long, piggish grunt and something started to creak rhythmically. Piranha moaned slightly out of time. Darnay shifted. That was only four, he murmured. So low, I only just caught the words. But basically, like, somebody is abusing the servants and then just using his money to pay to have them bound so that the memories are kind of taken away from them. And then, as I say, we get the hate to love trope, which is another trope that I don't really like. Um, and we have that here. So the next day, I hated him. He made it look so easy. Every smile was for Alter. Every joke was aimed in her direction. Every sideways glance made her blush and dip her head. I felt my heart winding tighter and tighter like a clock until I thought a spring would snap. The day we drove to the stonemasons for a couple of misspelt tombstones to replace the shelves in the diary, and the three of us sat side by side while he and Alter laughed and flirted as if they were already engaged. Part of me wished I'd come on my own, but I knew that it would have been worse to know that I'd passed up the chance to be within a few feet of him, even if he didn't meet my eyes once. As we lifted the last slab into the back of the car, he glanced up and I thought he'd look at me, but a second later he was helping Alter onto the seat, teasing her about the lettering on the marble, asking her if all her butter would come out marked with prepare for death. Had I imagined it all? Or was this his way of showing me that I was just a plaything? Once, when we stopped for Alter to squat behind a bush, he put his hand on the back of my neck. I started to turn to him, but he dug his fingernails into my flesh, holding me still. Every nerve I had was knotted into the space where his skin met mine. Alter was still within earshot. We sat like that, silent, until she wandered back to us with a posy of flowers to maintain the presence that she hadn't needed a piss. Uh, and then I wanted to read this little bit out here. Um, I think it's fake, actually. A novel. That must be why it's up here and not on my father's. Look. He held it open in front of me and pointed at the label inside the front cover against the patterned paper. There's no way this is a genuine sourly. For one thing, they've left the E off, Madame. I have no idea what you're talking about. Madame Sourly? The leading binder for pornography a hundred years ago. Wait, you mean novels? He added with a flicker of mockery. They're not real books. They're written like magazines. They're not actual people or actual memories. They're invented. Never mind. He closed the book and shook his head, half smiling. I can't believe how innocent you are. How am I supposed to know about things when no one ever tells me? Of course, your pure-minded parents. Don't worry, it's delightful. Go to hell, Darnay. No, really. I love it. He leaned forward, put his mouth to my cheek and murmured, and I mean innocent about everything. Never read a book, never fucked a girl, or a boy, apart from me. He ducked away, grinning, as I aimed a swipe at his head. I mean, I'm not really one for romance in general, but there's representation there and stuff, so I guess if you're into that. I like this, you can't really see it on the camera, but the fire has um, words written into it, which I think is very cool. So we're heading into part three here. I like this little quote here. Uh, De Havilland calls himself an artist, but ultimately a binder is merely the rectum through which waste is squeezed into another shape. The binder replies, if you think they're parasites, why do you pay them? If they're arseholes, why do you collect their shit? Touche. So uh, one of the characters is getting married and we get, you'd be surprised how many young couples find it useful to visit a binder before a wedding. Separately, of course. He tilts his head with a smile. It's quite the thing, you know. Particularly for young men who want a clean slate before they marry. Those little white lives can become a burden. It's so much better to start a new life with nothing to regret or hide. And then an interesting point later on, uh, Assuredly, my father says, he plucks a petal from the rose he's holding. It floats to the rug and lies there like a small wound. Because selling a true binding while the subject is still alive is, as we all know, illegal. I mean, a nice little bit of exposition, but I also think it's cool that she's, she's, she's thought it through that much, you know? Let me get one of the characters. He realises that no matter what he's done, he can't be as bad as his father, as long as he hasn't forgotten anything, you know? And how could you ever know in this world? And then we get a mention of someone drinking mead, which I thought was funny because um, Susie bought some mead recently and didn't like it. I can't even drink it because it's got honey in it. Yeah, no one fucks like that unless they've done it a lot. Um, I think I, I just like that. It's a good line. It's very true as well. So, uh, yeah, overall, I did enjoy the binding. Um, I mean, I didn't enjoy the romance elements so much and they were kind of quite important to the storyline. Um, and you get like the hate to love trope. Um, one of the characters basically is convinced that she's in love with someone from uh, first sight as well. Uh, just little things like that which sort of hamper my enjoyment a bit. Um, but overall it was very well written. I liked uh, the sense like 
uh, it just gives you a mouth feel. That's what I've been saying. Like, the, uh, it, it's like a, a really interesting dish or something where it just feels interesting and unique uh, on your tongue while you're eating something. Uh, and that's the same with this. I think every book, you kind of have a feel of the world, you know, just the sensation of it as it kind of washes over you. And it, it was particularly strong in this one. Overall, I would give it a 3.75 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Binding by Bridget Collins. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.